I'm going to be talking about the planned patient-centered visits building block. And we're going for each of the building blocks, we're going to run through that same kind of um, uh, sequence. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the rationale or the philosophy, the activities that the sites that we have worked with commonly prioritize in the building block, what resources we have available to help practice facilitators and clinics um, do the work of the building block, and then how, if you're a practice facilitator working with clinics, how you can support them in doing the work. And then we'll have a case that you'll um, you know, break into small groups like you did before and talk about it and kind of go from there. So um, in terms of the rationale for the planned patient-centered visits, as you recall, the way these building blocks came to be was through learnings from clinics that were um, deemed to be experts in quality improvement using team-based care. So it probably won't surprise you that um, for them, preparing and planning for clinic visits using um, the entire team at the uh, clinic was felt to be really, really important in caring for patients on long-term opioid therapy. And <clears throat> what we learned from these clinics is that um, they really felt like um, using this planned patient-centered visit um, strategy um, provided them a way to be consistent in the care that they provided for chronic pain. And it also um, allowed them to prepare for visits in which they might um, have to have conversations that um, could be difficult, like um, uh, you're on a very high dose of opioids, I'm concerned for your safety given the dose, and I'd like to begin tapering you. And so it um, allows um, the provider and the staff to think about how they want to use um, their communication skills um, with um, empathy um, as well as um, skill to have those um, conversations. So when you think about the team and how having these visits is a team-based activity, um, when you think about all the things that you, um, if, if a clinic puts into place a policy, for example, that includes having a patient agreement in place, checking the prescription monitoring program, doing urine drug testing at certain intervals, those kinds of things, um, by planning ahead, either through scrubbing the charts or looking at the charts the day before or in the morning huddle where the entire team, like a provider and a medical assistant, maybe a social worker, get together and talk about what's coming in the day, it allows the team to look at what's needed for, the, for that patient that day and figure out who's, who's going to do what. So um, are there assessments, for example, that um, like a, a PHQ-9 for depression um, or a PTSD assessment that needs to be done? Um, and can the MA do that before the provider gets in the room? Can the MA check the prescription monitoring program, which is possible in some states, so that that's in place when the provider sees the patient? Can the provider think about what they want to do with the patient in that visit and prepare for that? So that's where the whole team can really have a big impact. Um, and so, of course, by being able to look at the chart that allows and, and having the chart include um, the possibility for EHR, electronic health record templates, and so forth, um, then you can maintain a consistency of care and make sure that all of the screenings you want to do, the agreements that you want to have in place, um, are getting done in a very systematic way. And of course, um, you know, these patients, you know, chronic pain is, is, um, is a, you know, it's tough. It's their suffering that um, occurs for patients who are having chronic pain and have this brain disease. So it's important to think about the whole patient. Think about, you know, what else for this patient could be impacting their ability to be treated successfully. So things like sleep apnea or the stressors that they may have at home or, um, other complexities like mental health conditions can all um, diminish the ability to um, treat pain successfully. So making sure to assess, to make sure that all of those assessments are done um, as part of caring for the patient can really be helpful in, in treating the pain. Um, and as part of that, of course, um, for a number of providers and staff, seeing patients who have this degree of suffering can be challenging. And um, there can be stereotypes that are um, associated with seeing patients 
who have chronic pain, things that we assume about our patients. Um, and it's important as we look patient by patient to try to see um, who is this patient as an individual? What is their individual circumstance? Um, because it can be easy to think, oh, I kind of know what this patient um, is going gonna, is gonna to look like. So developing empathic communication pathways that involve kind of patient-centered communication can also be really important. And that's part of the philosophy of this um, building block. So what do clinics take, um, uh, take on when they um, uh, put into place the, the changes related to this building block? Um, I already talked a little bit about electronic health record templates. What they allow you to do is basically put into a template all the things you want to do to have consistent care. And so having those in place. And um, then some of the clinics also made sure, like I just said, to have pre-visit planning in place, have that standardized, in uh, worked into their workflow. So this is how we do that pre-visit planning, either the day before, the day of, or, or at a, another time. And a number of clinics also, um, the providers were trying to kind of squeeze the pain management in with hypertension, uh, chronic disease uh, of all sorts. And that's really hard because pain is its own condition and sometimes needs a, its own attention. So a number of clinics implemented intermittent visits that were specific to pain and that was very, very helpful. Um, they worked, the clinics wor have worked on ways to make this, um, these visits more of a partnership with patients, more of a way of co-management by um, educating themselves as well as educating their patients about chronic pain management, about um, the science of chronic pain, um, about opioid risks. And they also took opportunities to train staff and clinicians in, um, in some of these strategies for patient engagement and partnership. That that can look like motivational interviewing, or as I mentioned before, the use of patient-centered language that minimizes stereotypes and stigma and maximizes empathy. So um, a couple of good ideas that we got from clinics um, in terms of the electronic health record templates, one clinic had not just one electronic health record template, but it had a template for the medical assistant and a template for the provider. And I'm not remembering quite this, right now, but there might even have been a template for the front desk. And by creating these separate templates, it basically helps really clearly delineate what the roles are for the different um, members of the team as they're bringing a patient in for care. So that was a really um, innovative idea. And then the other um, really great idea that a clinic uh, undertook was something called a patient letter. So they changed their policies, they changed their um, procedures and their workflows. They knew that they'd made some pretty big changes by virtue of taking on the six building blocks. And they thought to themselves, wow, well, we can't just hit our, you know, surprise our patients with this. So they sent all of their patients a letter um, as they were instituting the program to say, hey, we've taken on this new approach to caring for pain. We're really interested in your safety and in um, following the best evidence-based care. So when you come next for your next appointment to discuss pain, you'll see that we'll be discussing your, ma your care management plan. Um, and so don't be surprised <laughs> by, some of, uh, by hearing some of the new ways that we're caring for pain. So that was a really great um, innovation, we thought. So we have a lot of resources. This uh, resource section in the, on the website has, uh, gosh, five different sections, everything from patient education to how to taper um, a patient um, in a safe and uh, slow way from their opioids, um, how to have empathic communication, patient-centered uh, communication, including scripts that can be used for difficult conversations for both staff and providers, and a video um, that shows uh, someone having uh, one of those conversations, um, different treatments that are not opioid related so that there are alternatives to provide when you may be tapering a patient, you have something else to offer, which can, it can often be difficult to take something away and not provide something else. And then uh, a section with resources on how to plan for visits. And of course, we always have our recommended assessments tab so that if you need assessments for PTSD or depression and anxiety, sleep apnea and so forth, those there. So Ashley's going to open up the website now and actually take you to a few of these resources. At the very top, you went to the resource library.
And then you went on the left-hand side to the resources for clinics. Yeah, that's great. And then you scrolled down to the patient-centered, each, you can see the different colors for the different building blocks. So here we are in planned patient-centered visits. Yeah, the first one was this patient letter. You can see this is a letter um, that basically just outlines, um, you know, how the clinic was changing its practices. And you can go to the website, take this letter, make it your own, put your logo on and use this if you want to take this approach as well. So this is a, um, something that's a staff, some staff guidance on difficult conversations. So it talks about, you can see, I can't actually see it because it's not quite large enough, but um, so uh, you can see there are conversation suggestions if you scroll down just a little bit, Ashley. So let's say a patient approaches the front desk demanding to pick up a, a refill um, early, and it um, provides um, some ideas for how to actually have that conversation that uses these quote unquote, five A's of acknowledging the patient, allowing, agreeing, affirming, and assuring. So um, these are really, really helpful. I know that um, I, as a provider, um, have some of these scripts in mind as I'm going into a room thinking, okay, how do I want to approach this and use some of, I mean, I literally use some of these um, scripts to do that. I don't, I don't always, uh, I'm not always as spontaneous as, as uh, you might think. So um, let's go to the next resource. This is um, a, a list of chronic pain self-management resources. So there are resources both for providers and for patients here. So if you wanted to have resources where, um, uh, for example, if you scroll down to the patient resources, there are some short videos that actually explain chronic pain, that ex explain what the condition is, how there are changes in the brain related to chronic pain and opioid use. And this, these can be very helpful, and they don't all involve reading, so they're, uh, they're both videos as well as um, reading, which I think can, because um, some patients um, aren't, aren't as big of readers as others. But there are also other resources that can be really helpful for people who really want to dig in and try to um, change their own um, pain patterns, um, including relaxation and all sorts of things. So very practical resources. And I think we might, ha might have one more resource we were going to share with you which actually is found up in the leadership and consensus um, uh, section. And that's um, about clinical opportunities. So if you wanted to share some clinical, some clinical learning opportunities with a clinic on how they could learn about chronic pain, there are CDC uh, interactive trainings um, that are you know, module by module and a variety of different webinars that um, you can attend, some of which also have education um, uh, credits. So um, please know that these kinds of resources are there. Take a look at these resources and see what's a good fit um, for you, your clinics as you work with them as a practice facilitator. Or for those of you who are, who are from clinics, you might be looking at them thinking, oh, I'd like to introduce this to my clinic. Um, so if you're a practice facilitator working with a clinic, how can you support the clinics in doing this work? Well, the one thing that I think is really interesting about this building block is that it actually draws from all the other building blocks um, to make sure that um, this work can be done. So first of all, when um, the clinics are doing their policies, procedures, and workflows work, those workflows help to clarify what the roles are of different clinic personnel. Um, either before a visit, during a visit, after a visit, that kind of thing. So you can go back to those workflows and count on those to help with these planned visits. Similarly, with tracking and monitoring. If you're tracking and monitoring um, whether a patient agreement's been signed, when the last PM uh, prescription monitoring program check was done, when the last urine drug test was done, then you have a resource to use as you are planning a visit. Second, um, there are other existing resources um, that you can help the clinic uh, identify that can help with planning for patient uh, management visits. So you all are clinics in a, in a network. I think, I'm not sure, that you have the same electronic health record across your um, clinics. But some clinics may have had providers that developed a particular template for pain that might be really helpful to another clinic. So if you learn about those, make sure to connect those sites to one another and to their ideas so that they can um, create electronic health rec uh, record templates, get new ideas, those kinds of things. And if there aren't templates, we have some electronic health record template examples on the website that you could provide to clinics. 
Um, and of course, the other thing is the prescription monitoring program use is very, very important. In Washington state, providers can delegate others to check the prescription monitoring program. So they could delegate a medical assistant or a pharmacist to do so. Um, so making sure that a clinic has that those kinds of resources in place, has their medical assistant signed up if that's possible, or has, um, you know, a... a um, a provider other other than a clinician other than the provider who can look up things on the prescription monitoring program will allow that person to do so ahead of the visit so that the provider has that as they're going into the room and they don't have to fuss with um, getting onto the site and, and uh, looking the patient up. Um, and in some of the sites, we also discovered that not all the providers were uh, signed up for the prescription monitoring program. And if that's the case, you can help those providers get, get signed up because sometimes um, it can be complicated. So you can provide a lot of support in that regard. As we've said, for almost all of these building blocks, there are challenges. This one is particularly interesting because there are challenges both for the clinical work for health professionals and there are challenges for patients who uh, have chronic pain, who are suffering, um, who have a disease that's really difficult, and they experience a lot of stigma and stereotypes. So it's hard for both health professionals and for patients. So um, I, I think it's important to acknowledge those challenges to the clinic, to make sure as a practice facilitator that you're familiar with the science of chronic pain so that you can kind of talk about um, talk about chronic pain in that way as a brain disease and role model that. But in addition, provide resources to the clinic on how to learn about the science of chronic pain um, and how to um, you know, provide resources that um, help um, all of us, you know, clinicians, staff, et cetera, um, understand um, kind of the stigma that patients may experience as they go through their lives and even in the medical office. Um, and that can help us have more empathy for patients who have this difficult disease. Um, and then of course, encourage incorporation of trainings related to chronic pain early on in the program so that you've got plenty of time to, to accomplish that over the course of the six building blocks. And finally, um, there are lots of practical resources. We showed you some of them on the website that can be um, supportive. I think um, we showed the patient letter, the scripts. There's a video, as I said, illustrating a difficult conversation. Um, as a practice facilitator, bring those up frequently as part of your quarterly meetings. On the shared learning calls, you could even show that video and, and have a conversation about it. Um, so there's lots of ways to bring in these resources as you are supporting clinics as a practice facilitator.